Hello, and welcome back to season two of the Adventures in CRE audio series. Today, we're talking understanding return metrics, pitfalls, and potential. Let's go. Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. All right. So today we're talking the pitfalls and potential of the right, you know, understanding the context of return uh, metrics. Mm -hmm. Spencer, I'm going to tee it on over to you, buddy. Let's go. Yes, I'll tee it on over to Michael. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is this is a great topic and uh, one that we spend sig a significant amount of time on uh, with a lot of our readers. Um, you know, there's various metrics out there and any one in isolation, uh, if you are focused on anyone in particular and you're not looking at the holistic approach of all the different return metrics that give you much more of a, a complete analysis, uh, you could potentially run into big trouble. Uh, so I think this, um, this episode is a, a little bit of a, a I don't want to say deep dive, but we're going to have a, a lot of conversations about common misconceptions and ways to be able to take all of these return metrics and actually look at them together and what people are missing by saying, cash on cash is king or the IRR is everything. Uh, and all, you know, I look at my multiple, you know, and that's what's important to me. So I think we're going to really hit on all those shortfalls and pitfalls when you're looking at that and why you need all of them uh, together to get the, the whole picture. Yeah. Let me set this up for a little bit. Um, a return metric is nothing else than um, a data point that tells you something about the analysis. And so there are some commonly used return metrics in the industry, internal rate of return, equity multiple, net, uh, net profit, um, uh, cash and cash return, free and clear return, et cetera. But really you can invent your own return metrics uh, because at the end of the day, you, you have this data point and that data point you use across deals. Uh, and so long as you use that metric consistently across deals, it tells you something about one deal in comparison to another. Uh, at the same time, these metrics, as Michael said, uh, they only tell you or, or, or they only uh, show you a piece of the puzzle, right? And, and so unless they're used in combination with other metrics, uh, they'll often fool you into thinking that a deal is better or worse. So fool you how? Than it really is. Well, you know, so let me give an example. I, I wrote a blog post, um, shoot, a few months back, um, but it was actually in response to some conversations I've had over the years with our readers around the, the cash on cash return metric. First off, a lot of people don't properly uh, use the cash on cash return metric. But when we, when we talk about cash on cash return, uh, generally speaking, that is uh, your net operating cash flow before debt, actually after debt, I'm sorry, free, free and clear is before debt, after debt divided by your equity contributed to date. Right, so different shops will will have a slightly you know different twist to that, but generally speaking, it's whatever cash flow that the property throws off in operation in a given year, and you divide that by the amount of equity that that uh, the the partners have contributed to the deal. That's your cash on cash return, and that metric is simply an operating cash flow metric. It tells you how much cash flow the property is going to throw off. Uh, but I've come across. Um, individuals over the years who who like to throw around this metric as if it's the end all be all and it's really not right. um in fact it, in my experience over the years it it's it's not especially valuable like, except for in cases where you really care about how much cash flow a property is going to produce in, in, a, in a given month in fact i i would rather partition the irr and and, and find and, and find properties that are more heavily weighted to operating cash flow as the metric to, to prefer rather than cash on cash return. But anyway, so I'm getting long winded. I would, I would hear from people and say, Oh yeah, cash on cash returns all that matters. Um, and so I, I got frustrated a little bit with hearing this over and over and over again. And so I wrote a blog post, uh, and in that blog post, I talked about the value of the cash on cash return, um, where, it doesn't have a lot of value. And then I set a, set all of this up with a case study and I called it the stadium. And that, that's the name of the blog post. No, that's the name of this case study that I have. Oh, okay. Uh, if they uh, wanted to find the blog post, what do you remember what it's called? 
Yeah, I'll tell you right now. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt what you were what okay. you were doing, yeah. but uh, the blog post is using the cash on cash return in real estate investment analysis. Okay. And then, so at, at the bottom of this, and I have this case study. I have a video that I, I walk through the case study with you. I also have an Excel file to show you this. But that the heading of the case study is a quantitative example, an eighteen point three percent average annual cash on cash return. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. But a negative two point eight percent levered IRR. That's and, and on a non-time uh, value of money basis, you still lose money in, in this scenario. And, and the, 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 basic, ba- the, the, uh, the crux of the scenario is this. Uh, you have a baseball stadium with a minor league team uh, that is committed for five more years at this baseball stadium. The seller is asking a million two for the stadium. And the baseball team pays $100,000 a year in uh, uh, lease. lease. In, in lease, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we, we layered in some debt, which gives you leverage. And in, with leverage, your returns uh, uh, improve. And if you calculate, right, that $100,000 a year over the five years, that's an average cash on cash return. When, again, when taking into account debt, I can't remember how much debt I included in my example of 18.3%. And you go, wow, that's, that's a great... It's yeah. a great return. Let's yeah. do this deal. I mean, if that's if, if that's all we looked at, if if, if that's all that mattered, this would be a, a no brainer. Uh-huh. Uh, but as you start doing your due diligence, you learn that this minor league baseball team has been negotiating with the city to build a new stadium, uh-huh. and it looks like this is going through. And therefore, it's a foregone conclusion that this team will vacate in in year five or at the end of of year five. Yeah. And move to a new stadium. And the thing about minor league baseball is there's not a huge deep market for this. And so when they vacate, there's no other team to fill the stadium. And therefore, the only value in this investment is the underlying land. And to get to that land, you've got to scrape the building. So, or the stadium in this case. So not only uh, at the end of the five years is all, the only value you have is in the land, but you also have to spend money to scrape the building. And and in the, the very you know high level scenario I use, we we assume, I think it was 100000 to scrape the building. We assume the land was worth a million dollars. So really you're, you're getting back in our reversion value, 900000 or maybe it was less. Than. Anyway, the, the point was in this hypothetical, uh, you actually lost money on this deal. But because there was healthy uh, yeah. operating cash flow during the hold period, it seemed like a good deal. Um, Michael? Yes. Uh, I mean, that's a perfect example of you know, looking at... Um, return metrics in a vacuum. And, you know, similar to Spencer, years back, I wrote a post, The Limitations of IRR. And a lot of us get out of school and IRR is king. You learn about IRR. Once you understand it, it's everything, right? Um, and there's there's a big limitation to that. And Spencer, you hit on it in, in you know, a little bit earlier when you said, well, frankly, I like to partition the IRR. You know, you could have a deal you're looking at and, you know, you could be looking at two deals. And this is what I discuss in this post. And, you know, both could have a 15% IRR. Well, you know, if you are somebody who's looking for cash flow early on, you know, one, one investment, all of that IRR could be coming in year 10 from the reversion value of the building. And in the other investment, it's shooting off a ton of cash flow early on and the reversion value is nothing. And so that doesn't, the IRR alone won't tell you anything. Oh, well, if you're an investor looking for cash and you say, oh, 15 IRR, I'm going in. And then, you know, you're getting $10,000 or, you know, year one, year two, and all of a sudden you're like, I need I'm invested and my money's trapped in my building and I can't get any cash out, but hell, it was a 15 IR and that's the expectation. Well, you could go next door in the other building, you know, stabilize, you're, you're pulling a cash on cash of, I'm just shooting out a number 10% every year or 8%, uh, and, but the building's going up, you know, very modestly uh, on the reversion value. So, you know, this is just another example where, you know, cash on cash, you can't look at a loan. IRR, you can't look at a loan. There, there's, there's a lot of other things that go in because IRR is a function of time, right? Um, and so, you know, that helps with the time piece, but you also need to understand what Spencer said, the partitioning of where is the IRR value coming from? Is, is the building increasing a lot? Is this cash flow? Is it both? Um, so, yeah, so you know, <clears throat> so I, I, have a, I have a good real life example of, of how IRR can be misleading. Um, uh, Years ago, we do a, a little bit of consulting in our spare time, and uh, we had a client uh, who had a value add strategy, right? So his hold periods were eighteen months to three years, and he had a, a, a portfolio of properties, and he, he had asked me to aggregate 
the returns from this portfolio of properties and estimate the the portfolio level returns and then roll that into partnership level returns. And so I did some analysis. I think it was a two a two year hold, and there was some you know uh, ungodly IRR two hundred and fifty percent or something like that, right? And and it looked really healthy and and intriguing. And he said, well, you know, it might take us a little bit longer, so let's do a let let's look at it on a three year hold. Well, I so I put it on three year hold and really all that happened from year two to year three is there was a little bit of rent growth mm. and uh, the IRR went from 250 to 150 and I sent it back to him and he immediately just assumed there must've been an error, right? <laughs> how, how could the deal be that much less profitable from year two to year three? But what was interesting, and this is a good segue into uh, the, the ultimate uh, point of this <laughs> uh, episode. If you looked at the equity multiple, it actually grew from year two to year three. So what happened? Well, uh, the, the time value of money uh, is heavily weighted to the first few years. And so you, when you have short-term hold strategies, IRR is kind of a waste. Yes. You know, we, it's funny. I, I talk to people, and, you know, they, it, 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 for development in particular, you know, they, we have conversations and they're ecstatic. I have a 50% IRR on a development deal. Well, you know. That says something, you know, if you're comparing development deals, you know, the IRRs should be, but really it's, it's the equity multiple. I mean, there, there's a bunch of different things to be looking at, but the, the, you know, dispenser's point, the IRR is a little bit of, a little bit of a challenge to really value the success of, of your development in particular in your short-term home. So let me say in that scenario. Okay. So IRR in that case would be irrelevant is what you're saying. Uh, not necessarily. Not, so meaning you would not be optimizing toward that metric. Well, two things. First yeah. off. Any metric is irrelevant in a vacuum. So it has to be paired with other metrics that give you a more holistic view okay. of the investment. That's number one. Number two, uh, any metric is irrelevant unless it's compared against other deals that you're using the exact same methodology to compare it, right? And it, so in, in finance, for those who, who have taken finance classes, finance is all about comparison. We look at 100 potential investment opportunities. Sure. And we calculate a uh, net present value or internal rate of return or a host of other things to compare all of these investments and conclude what's the best investment to make. Mm -hmm. And so these, these metrics are, are really not worth anything unless you have consistent, uh, con you, you have convention across your, your, your underwriting and you're looking at a host of deals and then you can compare it because your 10, your 10% internal rate of return doesn't mean much to me because I, I may, underwrite differently than you. So I may get a 10 and you may get a 10. Uh, my 10 may be better or worse than your 10, mm -hmm. depending on how I look at the deal, how I underwrite, how conservative I am. Uh, you might be using a five-year hold. Now you might be using a 10-year hold and then it really uh, it matters a lot less. And, and you know, you, you touched on it. Really, It's you as the investor, what are you really looking for, right? And to Spencer's point about, you know, the IRR dropping from 250 to 150, but the equity multiple going up, like you as an investor, if you're looking at a deal and somebody's like, I have a development deal and, you know, for, for this, it's a 250% IRR. And for this one, it's 150% IRR. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go to the 250. However, all you had to do was wait six months for, you know, the 150% IRR, but maybe you added 30 to 40% of profit by waiting another 60, you know, waiting another six months, which let's say you got that money back early on uh, with the 250% deal. What are you going to reinvest that yeah, money reinvestment to, capture risk. That, yeah. to capture that other, uh, you know, money that you lost? It takes you a while to find a good opportunity. So, you know, IRR again is not the end all be all. And that's, that's the reinvestment rate. Like what, what are your other opportunities? Like that's a, that's a whole other topic. You know, if you have a, a five year hold, but the IRR is screaming and then you have a 10 year hold and the IRR is good. Uh, or I shouldn't say the IRR, all these, when you're looking at everything, uh, if you like the five-year deal, think about what you're going to do for the next five years with that money. Because if there's no better opportunity than the 10-year deal, then maybe it makes sense to go for that 10-year deal because it's it's going to be out longer and it's going to be returning a lot more in aggregate. So that, that's another kind of dimension of, of thinking about this when you're thinking of all the return so, metrics. So maybe, maybe we choose like a pivot point here because it kind of, so it seems to me like we've done a pretty good job of establishing when and when not, or maybe how and not to use it. I think we're talking theory right now. Right. So, so let's pivot now okay. and say, okay, you've, you've been listening to this and you say, Oh, 
that makes a lot of sense. So what's next? So how, I mean, where's the potential? You know, we, maybe we've talked about the pitfalls, I guess, right? So where's the potential lying in understanding, you know, these things, these I, metrics? You know, in, in my view, um, every firm, uh, every individual investor ought to have their strategy and then return metrics that help them decide whether an opportunity fits their strategy or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, no return metric fits every strategy or every scenario. Um, and, and so the individual investor, the individual firm needs to conclude for themselves that those return metrics are the, one, the ones that will tell them whether this is an investment worth doing or not. And then two, find a consistent underwriting strategy such that every deal they look at, they're, they're looking at it the exact same way so that they can compare the metrics between deals and they're comparing apples to apples. Yeah, so we can even make up an example, right? Like how you would utilize this. I mean, let's go core multifamily gateway, gateway city, right? Perfect. Um, uh, let's say, you know, start off and we could, you know, let's, we won't get into cap rates, but we'll start off, you know, the market's a five cap, Yields or cash on cash for for this type of asset is you know I'm just gonna make it up five six percent. Um, the building values are in a stable growth. You think they grow two three percent a year? So all right, I'm looking for all these combined. I want like a five six percent yield. That makes sense for the risk. The building has to be in a well. It has to be in a, a good location and be of good enough quality because it's Class A. That there shouldn't be a drop in value, but it shouldn't go through the roof because you're paying for the, um, the, not the risk, but you're paying for the, the security of the stabilization right. of that. Right. So right. it's not going to, maybe it shoots through the roof, but maybe not. You're not, that's not the play. So it grows a couple so, you know, you're looking at a 1.35, making it up equity multiple, your IRR, your levered IRR will be 10, 11%. And you want a yield of what's like your, uh, what's your hold period? Like 10 years, 10 years. Okay. So, so I mean, you know, that could be, all in combination, right? You need to understand that, right? So if I just say I'm going in with a five, six percent yield, um, and that's what I'm looking for, but there's some big problem with the building, and maybe let's shift to office, right? There's a there's a there's a great tenant in there, and you know their renewal rates high risk, and maybe there's not a lot of tenants in the market. Um, you know that building at exit, yeah, you have a great yield, but again, like Spencer said, with the with the softball team or with the minor league baseball team, you know, you're going to be releasing that and that becomes <clears throat> no longer a core play. It becomes a value add. If it's a whole building, maybe it's even opportunistic. Yeah. That yeah. may be out of strategy. Well, well hold on just one yeah. second. So maybe let's, can we go back to the first example that Michael gave Yeah. and give me a summary? Cause it almost act as if that was Michael's strategy. Yeah, and you're so, consulting with Michael. No, that's a good point. Yeah. So he, he had uh, articulated a strategy core multifamily, and then he'd begun to articulate an underwriting methodology. Uh -huh. So every deal he looks at, he's going to he's going to analyze on a ten year hold. By the way, that doesn't mean he's actually going to own this for ten years. Right. He may own it for fifty. He may own it for five. But his underwriting is consistent. Ten year hold. Uh, he's going to he's going to underwrite a consistent change in cap rate over that whole period. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, it's common in the industry to grow your cap rate by fifty or seventy five or hundred basis points over a ten year hold. He's going to stick to that. Because his strategy is fairly consistent, uh, core, gateway, or, or tier one markets, um, stabilized, newer class A property, uh, he can, with some confidence, say, yeah, my baseline is a, let's say, 50 basis point growth in cap rate over a 10-year hold. Uh -huh. All right. uh, he is going to underwrite some consistent expense growth and rent growth. And, and he'll have properties that may... Uh, outperform the, his baseline. So he, he said two to three percent in um, income growth, and and so maybe let's say two percent is is his baseline income growth, and two percent is his baseline operating expense growth. And there's a an especially tight submarket, and he has he's looking at a property he believes rents are under market. He might underwrite that at two and a quarter, but he knows that he's underwriting at twenty five basis points above his baseline his conventional underwriting so he, he develops these conventional underwriting standards to match his strategy and then he pairs uh return metrics with that strategy and those underlining standard uh, underwriting standards so maybe he uses an internal rate of return mm -hmm. uh maybe he uses a equity multiple 
Um, but in, in combination, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And they have to match. Like, and like, you're checking off the boxes of each one, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so he's solving for an equity multiple. He's sor- solving for, for a unlevered and levered IRR. Um, he's, he's looking at uh, operating income metrics such as cash on cash return or free and clear return. Uh, maybe he's looking at an, um, an average... Uh, uh, return over the whole period, which is is essentially un- unlevered IRR without the time value of money uh, el- element to it. Um, so he might have a, a basket of return metrics that he's solving for. And then he just goes out and he starts looking at deals. And he looks at 100 deals and he underwrites them consistently. And he has this consistent strategy. And pa- the, the property starts to emerge with you know, they start to look similar because all those strategies are in line as, yeah. you're, as you're projecting forward. And then all of a sudden you, you define your basket, um, you know, of what, of what you're looking for. So, okay. But it's, it's holistic. So, and, but let me finish. So, yeah. so you do a hundred properties. If you were to underwrite those all at the exact same moment, you could put them in a matrix and the return metrics would tell you which deals to do or not all else being equal. Right, because you have created some convention across your strategy and your underwriting standards. Now, there's a lot. There is a lot more that goes into this. It's yeah. not all. Well, it seems uh, to me like it's one of those but, situations to where there's the art and the science of the the thing. Right yeah. there, there's always an art and a science, and everybody wants it just to be the science. Mm-hmm. You know, that way it's black and white. But to me, there's there's the marriage of the art, which maybe is the strategy, right? Is the strategy that you're taking and then marrying that with the science that makes the most sense to, to fit, to dovetail into that, um, into that strategy. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. Um, so we were talking about a very simple strategy, multifamily core 10 year hold. When you start getting into shorter term holds or more opportunistic, uh, strategies and, and Michael's well aware of this, Uh, he, he lived in that space, uh, these things get a little bit more uh, uh, squishy, sure. right? And, and then you are looking to the qualitative more. Uh, even even then, uh, the shorter the hold period is, the more you're looking at uh, what what I call a yield on cost. I think you have a similar name for it, but it's basically what your stabilized pro forma NOI is divided by your your project cost, and you compare that to market cap rate for the exact same building if it was stabilized and complete today, and if there's some um, spread there, then it, it may be worth the risk to take that, to, to, to make that opportunistic investment. Mm-hmm. And I say opportunistic, that could be value add and like renovation buy, fix sell, or, or it may be development. Um, and Is, do you have any, like, so you, you shared a uh, story about some consulting, uh, where maybe consulting or day job or whatever, what is an experience and, or maybe example of where you've taken, you know, this, you know, pairing the right metrics with a strategy. Can you share anything like that that you can think of offhand? I know that's kind of a, I didn't prep you for that, but it's kind of, I'm really interested to see in the real world where you might have taken, you know, gone through the process of figuring out, hey, here's how we're going to uh, measure success sure. in, yeah, in this strategy. Um, yeah, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole host of things. You know, a lot of these metrics, you know, so, so, as as an example, you know, let's 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 use an experience I had, but yeah. you know, it's it's development all the way to to exit, right? We're, sure. We're developing a building, you're going to hold it for a couple of years, and you're, we're we're exiting. Um, you know, you underwrite it at the very early onset stages, and you're looking at all these different things. You're looking at, you know, what's what is the IRR that's standard for a develop and hold? Like, wh- where is that on the risk? return spectrum like where should these irs land in our case it was upper teens low 20s that's only one piece though right so um so that was one the other thing is the equity multiple which is you know for us needs to be above a two at least for development so you know that is you're getting double your money back you're earning 70 percent at least over the time from development and hold you know as things change as construction costs go up as politics get in the way of your time, like all of these things start to factor in and they heavily impact IRR, right? They heavily impact equity multiple because now you're spending more money, you have, you have bigger carrying costs. And so all of these are constantly being assessed, right? And you know now you have money sunk into the deal, it's not as easy to get out. And so you need to keep you know reviewing these things and then it comes to, well, can we push rents a little more? What's going on in the market? Is that if this is a, 
a hotel? Can we get, you know, our ADRs up higher? And now you're, you know, it gets a little financial yeah, engineering, yeah. but you're constantly looking at all of them. Maybe, you know, if it's taking longer, it, it taxes your IRR, right? Like the, like it's, if you had a, a development deal that was supposed to be completed and, un, and operating in three years, if that goes to five years, you know, your IRR is starting to look pretty soft, should I say. Uh, and then, you know, however, you know, you're still in the deal. Maybe your equity multiples looking better because you're able to push, you know, ADR or, or rent a lot higher. And so, you know, they're, they're, these are the ways you kind of have to keep analyzing and make sure that the pro- project still makes sense. Because if, if all of these in combination, maybe the IRR is soft, but the equity multiple is good and the partnership waterfall is based on an equity multiple, you might start paying a little more attention to that. And if you're a developer and you're in a high risk area, equity multiple is a good way to partner, to, to okay. structure your partnership. Um, that's another topic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how you got to look at everything holistically, not in a vacuum. You're constantly okay. readjusting and, and reevaluating your, your metric. I'm doing well, so, yeah. So, and, and my conclusion, um, if that was your conclusion, my line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So the, I mean, the, the two big points I want to make is if you're on some forum somewhere on the Internet and uh, someone says, oh, I, I always solve for a a 6% IRR, or I always solve for a 8% cash on cash return. That doesn't mean anything to you because you underwrite differently. Your strategy is probably a little bit different. And so uh, ignore that chatter. Now, what, what matters is you have your own strategy. You have your own methodology. You have your own metrics. You understand those three elements and what they tell you about a potential deal and, and then make decisions based on that together with a whole host of other qualitative and quantitative uh, elements. Yeah. And, and, and you hit it with the qualitative, right? It's not, it's not numbers on a spreadsheet at all. It is a, it is a tangible thing you're looking yeah. at and, and it is in context very much. So the yeah. market, what the building looks like, the tenants and all that. So. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. You guys, thank you so much. And hopefully for those of you listening, uh, you know, you learned something and you can apply that. And uh, if you have any more questions, go and read, what was the name of the, of the post? You remember? Uh, using the cash on cash return metric and an investment okay. analysis. Fantastic. Yeah. And also limitations of IRR. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the Accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com accelerator.